The book of Acts has been assigned many titles, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the Acts of Apostolic People, and one cynic called it the Mistakes of Peter and Paul. Um, Another title is How the Gospel Went from Jerusalem to Rome. But whatever you choose to call it, I think everybody would agree that this is a great book in our New Testament, a a book of great value to the church in every generation. So I I hope you'll be as excited about this study as I am. I know if you grew up in the Church of Christ, you heard the book of Acts, at least little bits and pieces of it. But I hope we can, again, put it together and see, see what Luke is saying in this great document. And right now... Uh, Keaton, I'd like for us to read the text that I'm going to be preaching from. It's Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And all through this series, I'm going to use the New Living Translation. I've really come to love this version of the Bible. And it is a, a paraphrase in a lot of ways. But I think for this narrative story that we're going to be looking at, the New Living Translation will be very, very good. But here's how it goes. Dear Theophilus. In my first book, I told you about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he ascended to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions from the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. On these occasions, he talked to them about the kingdom of God. In one of those meetings, as he was eating a meal with them, he told them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you what he had promised. Remember, I've told you about this before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, are you going to free Israel now and restore our kingdom? The Father sets those dates, he replied, and They're not for you to know, but when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and will tell people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, the traditional view from very, very early in church history was that the author of this book is a man named Luke a traveling companion of Paul. And Paul called him our dear friend, the doctor, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14. Luke also wrote the book that we call the Gospel of Luke, the third book in our New Testaments. And and as I've read a lot of stuff about this, there's no good reason to doubt that he's the author. I believe that Luke is the writer of this book. I would place the date about A.D. 61 or 62. I know there are some people think it was written near the end of the second century. No reason to think that. I believe it's very early, perhaps the very early part of the 60s. And, And Luke's purpose in writing may well have been to show the triumphant march of the gospel from those small beginnings in Jerusalem until it reached Rome, the heart of the empire. He doesn't tell us anything about how the gospel went to the east, Persia, or India, but we know it went there. He only gives a little taste of what it was like as it went into Africa with the Ethiopian eunuch. Nothing much about traveling to the north, into the Balkan states. It really seems that he wants to trace the gospel going from Jerusalem to Rome. And it's triumphal uh, march in that way. But I want to suggest another possible reason for the book. And and what I'm going to tell you I think can be disputed. But I really would like to ask for your thoughtful consideration. And I think this has really some good implications for us in our day and time. If you know your New Testament, you know that both Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and Acts are addressed to Theophilus. You saw that name up here, dear Theophilus. I take that to mean a real historical person. Now, some believe that Theophilus, which means either loved by God or lover of God, some people believe that that is just a a symbolic name for every Christian reader who ever reads the book. 
All of you who love God, here's my story. That may well be, but the evidence points, I think, to a specific individual. In the Gospel of Luke, Theophilus is addressed as most excellent Theophilus. Other translations say most honorable or your excellency. This word is used in the New Testament only by Luke. In, in uh, Luke 1, 3, most excellent Theophilus. And later on in the book of Acts, he uses this same word to address Felix and Festus, who were two governors of the province of Judea, replacing Pilate and in succession. A modern equivalent might be your honor, as we would address a judge or a magistrate today. I believe that Theophilus was very likely a high-ranking Roman official who had heard a lot of anti-Christian talk and slander, and Luke, in both books, is defending Christians, and he's defending their way of life, and he shows how Roman officials were consistently friendly to Christianity. And I want to take a little time to develop that idea, that point. The very first encounter with any kind of Roman official is in Luke chapter 7, when a Roman centurion, like a captain, somebody over a hundred soldiers, but a Roman centurion sent for Jesus to come to his house and heal his servant. And while Jesus was on his way, this man had second thoughts and he sends word, no, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. Just speak the word. And I know my servant will be healed. And Jesus said of this Roman, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Luke chapter 7 verse 9. Later on, we know that Jesus stood trial before the Roman governor, Pilate. And you know what Pilate declared? This is Luke 23, 14 and 15. You brought this man to me, he says to the Jewish leaders. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I've examined him thoroughly on this point and find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion. The scripture tells us that up to this point, Herod and Pilate had been enemies, but after that time, they were friends. You know what brought them together? Their agreement about the fact that Jesus is innocent of trying to start a revolt. At the crucifixion, the Roman centurion in charge of the execution saw how Jesus died. And in Luke 23, 47, he says, surely this man was innocent. And I know somebody's going to say, no, no, he didn't say that. The Roman centurion said, surely this man is the son of God. Yes, in Matthew and Mark, he says that. But Luke has him saying, this man is innocent or righteous. In Acts, the themes continue. The first Gentile convert to Christianity is who? Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and all of his family, Acts chapter 10. Later on, on the first missionary journey, we meet the Roman governor of Cyprus, Sergius Paulus, a man who wanted to hear the word of God and who, after hearing it, became a believer in Christ, Acts chapter 13. In the city of Philippi, the magistrates come and apologize to Paul for putting him in jail for no good reason, Acts 16. In Corinth, the proconsul Gallio refuses to indict Paul, even though a lot of Jews in the town are accusing him of various infractions. That's Acts chapter 18. In Ephesus, the mayor of the city declared that Paul and his friends are innocent of the charges that Demetrius and the silversmiths were bringing against them, Acts 19. Felix and Festus and King Agrippa all fail to convict Paul of any offense. And here's what they said. This man has not done anything worthy of death or imprisonment. Acts chapter 26 verse 32. They couldn't find any reason to, to you know, even really send him to Caesar. But Paul has, had made his appeal and so to Caesar he had to go. And as he's being transported to Rome... For trial under Caesar, he was in the custody of Julius, 
a captain in the imperial regiment. And Luke tells Theophilus that Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs, Acts 27.3. And finally, after the shipwreck on the island of Malta, Paul met Publius, the chief official there, and Luke says he welcomed us courteously and he fed us for three days. I believe that Luke is making the case to Theophilus that Christianity is no threat to Rome. The church isn't trying to overthrow the Roman government. And to that end, he shows how some governing officials actually embraced Christianity and how Roman judges could find no legal basis for uh, for prosecution. I think that's one of the things he's doing with this book. It just seems so apparent to me as you look at what I've tried to describe. Now, there's an application for us, folks. As Christians, as the church, we're not here to do harm to anybody. We are not here to overthrow the government. Our activity should be that which is spiritually useful and healthy to the community and to the country. It is to be just. It is to be honest. It's to be peaceful in accordance with the teachings of Christ. Remember what Paul asked us to do? 1 Timothy 2.2, that we were to pray for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Now, that doesn't mean we can't be involved in the political process. Certainly we can. But, folks, we are to model a different lifestyle, one that's helpful, one that's useful. As Paul urged in Romans 12 and verse 18, do your part to live at peace with everyone as much as possible. And I think Luke is saying to Theophilus and maybe other officials, these people are innocent. If you have any of them in jail, let them go because they're not a threat. And I think we can take our cue as to how we are to live and conduct our lives uh, in this country. Now let's go on to the rest of the text. Luke says that his first book was about everything Jesus began to do and teach. From that... We can assume that this second book tells about what Jesus continued to do and teach through his followers, the church. I love Eugene Peterson's introduction to Acts in his, uh, his uh, paraphrase, the message. But he says this, the story of Jesus doesn't end with Jesus. It continues in the lives of those who believe in him. The supernatural does not stop with Jesus. Luke makes it clear that these Christians he wrote about were no more spectators of Jesus than Jesus was a spectator of God. They are in on the action of God, God acting in them, God living in them, which also means, of course, in us. And I think this is one thing we've got to get right as we study the book of Acts. Christ is still at work in his church. What he began to do while he was here, he continues to do through his people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, Luke also tells what Jesus did to prepare his disciples for what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost, for that that renewal, for that revival that was going to happen on Pentecost. In verse 2, we're told he gave them solid teaching or instruction, and it came from or through the Holy Spirit. And those are two elements which must always be present in any renewal, in any revival, the Word of God, solid instruction from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Lewis Drummond once said that a spiritual awakening always soars on the wings of the Word. It always begins there. And I just want to say as we continue our journey As a church, wherever we're going to go as a congregation, all that we do and all that we are must be rooted and grounded in God's word. No matter how unpopular that might be, no matter how politically incorrect it may be, we must have everything based on the word of God. And I think as a church, we've tried to do that. 
I think we've really tried to emphasize the word. You know, that's why we read the scripture every Sunday in our assembly. I didn't grow up with that happening, did you? Now, we heard the Bible sometimes in sermons, but I don't ever remember just having the word read. But that's what we've tried to do here for years, just the word. Let it speak to you. Psalm 111, Hebrews 13 today. It had no real connection with the sermon. It's just the word of God. And that's why we do that, because we want to be rooted and grounded there. That's why we have Bible classes for all ages. That's why we encourage everyone to read their Bibles daily. That's why I preach expositorily almost all of the time. And that's why I've decided to go through the book of Acts again. So we can see more clearly how God wants to operate through his church. And this emphasis on the word, it will continue. As long as I have anything to say about it, it will continue. Because that's one of the elements of renewal and revival. But the second element that's introduced in our text is the Holy Spirit. Did you notice that the Spirit is mentioned three times in these eight verses? Verse 2, verse 5, verse 8. Overall... The Holy Spirit is mentioned at least 55 times by name in the book of Acts. That's an average of almost two times per chapter. And that alone, I think, reveals the importance of the Spirit in the life of the church. In our text, Luke tells us that Jesus gave his instruction. He gave his teaching from the Holy Spirit. Or other versions say through or by or with the help of the Spirit. And that would indicate that that it was the Spirit of God within Jesus who was giving the instruction. Later, he told his disciples they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, verse 5. And in verse 8, he says, you will receive power from the Spirit when he comes upon you. So the Spirit of God is very important in the life of the church. Now, we're all aware of the many different interpretations found throughout the church as to what it means to be filled or baptized or indwelt or empowered by the Holy Spirit. A lot of different interpretations. Over here I have a brother who thinks the Spirit only dwells in you as the Word dwells in you. But over here is a sister who believes that the Spirit gives all manner of spiritual gifts including speaking in tongues and in healing. And in between are all sorts of other views about the Spirit of God. What are we supposed to do with those different interpretations? Obviously, the first and most important thing is we are to love each other. I mentioned the two extremes, if you want to call them that. I need to love that brother and sister and accept them as being part of the body of Christ, even though there are some real differences there. We also need to realize, though, that that if we are Christians, we have been given the Holy Spirit to live within us. And Paul was so bold as to say in Romans 8 and verse 9, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. That's, That's strong language. And it also seems very clear to me from this text that that the church's mission in this world cannot be carried out without the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit's power, the most excellent plans and programs will ultimately fail. Although we may give an appearance of success. I just read this week, one one guy said he thought that 95% of the work of the evangelical church in the United States today is done without the Spirit. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on. But without the Spirit's power, we ultimately will fail. So whoever we are, And whatever we believe about the Holy Spirit, our great desire should be that we want to be filled with and led by the Spirit of God so that our work will spring from His power and not from our own. And I'm not going to provide any definitive solution or answer to these different interpretations and experiences. I I don't know how to deal with that. I just want to urge you to do one thing. And that is pray. You pray. And as a congregation, we pray that the Holy Spirit will do what he wants to do in our individual lives. And he will do what he wants to do in this church. 
Pray that we will be open to and willing to follow the Spirit's leading, the nudging, and the prodding that we feel in our lives all the time. And let us be open and willing to let him move in the lives of other believers in ways that may be different than what he's doing in our life. And let's be willing to let him move in the life of the church. Remember this word from Scripture? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 12 and verse 11, all these, and he's talking about the various gifts that he's just mentioned there, all kinds of gifts. He says, all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them as he determines. And we just need to be open to let the Spirit move in our lives, in the lives of one another, and in the life of our church as he determines. And let's not forget what our primary work is. The last verse of our text, he says, when you've received power, when, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will tell people about me. Other versions say, you will be my witnesses everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's our task, to tell everybody we know about Jesus and about the good news that he brings into this world. So as we go about that task, I want this to be our prayer. This is the chorus to a song written in 1964 by Bill and Gloria Gaither. And you know how I love the Gaithers. Not everybody does, but I do. But listen to this prayer and let this be, you know, the attitude that we have. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in your strength and your power. Come in your own gentle way. And I pray that that will be our prayer. Would you bow with me now? Father, we do pray that in your way you will send your Spirit into our lives and that we will be open and receptive and willing to obey and to go where you lead us through your spirit. Father, help us to not attempt anything without that guidance. And I know we, we fail, and sometimes we, we don't hear, sometimes we don't want to hear, sometimes I guess we're willfully disobedient. But I pray that the willingness, the obedience, will be greater and stronger in our hearts and in our individual, individual lives and in our lives uh, in our life as a congregation. Father, we're open. Send your spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. And come in your own gentle way. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.